And now please give a warm virtual welcome to Stephen Heyman. Take it away, Stephen. Okay. Well, thank you so much for having me. I'm delighted to be here. This is my first event in Ohio where this story um, begins. Um, I'm going to I'm going to launch my little PowerPoint here. So just give me one second to get situated. Okay, so you should see just the cover of my book now. Is that right? Okay, I think I have the mic. So I'm just going to trust that you're seeing the cover of my book. Anyways, um, five years ago, I moved to Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Um, uh, my wife um, uh, took me to Pittsburgh. She uh, was headed there for grad school, and I'm a journalist, and I was looking for a story. And I happened to meet a lamb farmer by the name of uh, John Jameson, who is something of an elder statesman in the world of sustainable agriculture. And uh, we were talking, um, and he was telling me about what got him interested in farming. You know, he and his wife, Suki, had been English majors in school. They didn't have any agricultural background. And he kind of mentioned offhandedly this guy named Louis Bromfield, who had a farm in Ohio. And I wrote the name down in my notebook. And when I got home, I typed it into Google. And I fell down this marvelous rabbit hole where I, I discovered somebody who had been extraordinarily famous in mid-century America. And indeed, he had, he had a farm that was uh, a household name, Malabar. You know it very well, probably, since you're not too far from it. Um, uh, the farm was so famous that E.B. White wrote an ode about it in the New Yorker magazine, and Lauren Bacall and Humphrey Bogart got married there in 1945. And from this farm, he popularized a lot of ideas of early environmentalism, a lot of ideas that we now categorize under the label of uh, organic agriculture. Um, but a little bit of further research quickly revealed that Bromfield had this extraordinary earlier existence as a lost generation novelist living in Paris between the wars and hanging out with people like Gertrude Stein and Ernest Hemingway. And I, I was just amazed um, that this person had, had vanished from popular memory and that he, his biography seemed to combine these two divergent worlds, you know, agriculture and literature, Ohio and France. So I set out to find out more and that led to this book project. Um, so I'm just going to take you through kind of a brief overview of this, uh, of the book. Um, let's begin in Paris in 1925. Here you have Bromfield with two of his best known contemporaries. On the left is Ernest Hemingway, on the right F. Scott Fitzgerald. Now all three of these guys are Midwesterners, all three of them headed east in search of what the literary critic Malcolm Cauley called new prairies of the mind. Um, Bromfield, like Fitzgerald, was an Ivy League dropout, and like Hemingway, he was a uh, volunteer ambulance driver in World War I. Um, but they all met in Paris, and at the time of their meeting, uh, Hemingway and Fitzgerald were not in the best position in a relative sense. Um, Hemingway was struggling to get his first novel off the ground, and Fitzgerald had just published the, uh, the Great Gatsby, which today we know as the, uh, you know, the quintessential American novel. But he was devastated by its poor sales. And he actually wrote to his editor in November of 1925, you know, um, is Gatsby dead? Uh, little did he know, the, uh, the, you know how it would become a kind of canonical work of literature. So um, Bromfield, on the other hand, was riding high at this moment. Uh, the New York Times pronounced him the best of all the young American novelists. And you know, um, he had written a string of best-selling novels beginning in 1924 with The Green Bay Tree. Um, and you know, his books today, they strike us as kind of uh, 
post-Victorian in style. They feature these kind of um, very headstrong, independent-minded female protagonists who are trying to break free from their um, stultifying Midwestern backgrounds. Usually they do this by um, uh, reconnecting with nature or, or moving to Europe, which is, um, of course, what Bromfield did himself. Um, so he's, he moves to Paris at the, at the end of 1925, and he falls quickly in love with the city. You know, he doesn't take the typical lost generation route. He moves into the right bank instead of the left bank. Um, he rents a lavish apartment using the profits from his first two novels, overlooking the Bois de Boulogne. Um, and he paints landscapes in the Bois, and he gets fabulous antique furniture for his apartment, and he goes on vacation. There he is in the bottom, dancing with uh, his novelist and playwright friend, Edna, Fer Edna Ferber, excuse me. So, um, uh, Bromfield had a, a, an extraordinarily interesting and complex relationship with Ernest Hemingway. Um, his third novel, Early Autumn, and Hemingway's first novel, The Sun Also Rises, came out at the, uh, in the same week in October of 1926. Um, and Early Autumn, it rocketed up the bestseller lists. It won the, uh, it went on to win the 1927, uh, or, the, or the, the Bolzer Prize in 1927. Um, Hemingway's book, which is now seen as a masterpiece, of course, was uh, dismissed by his hometown newspaper as a, a bushel of sensationalism and triviality. And obviously this disappointed the hell out of Hemingway and he, he pours out his frustration in a remarkable letter um, that I found uh, to his editor, Maxwell Perkins. Um, and in this letter, you know, Hemingway had been hanging out with Bromfield, enjoying his hospitality, kind of cozying up to him. And Bromfield had even tried to get Hemingway a publisher for The Sun Also Rises. But Hemingway was very kind of, well, two-faced in this relationship. And uh, while he was being nice to Bromfield, he was also writing letters behind his back where he kind of savaged his work and made fun of his house and called his wine mediocre. Um, but I think the je jealousy, um, like the, the, uh, that pettiness concealed a, a real jealousy on Hemingway's part. And when he wins the Pulitzer, Bromfield wins the Pulitzer, it kind of comes out in this letter and he says, um, this is Hemingway talking. I, 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 I had written 40,000 words of this kind of conventional literary tripe, which I cut out of the manuscript of The Sun Also Rises. It's what the critics would have wanted, but it, it, it would ring as false 10 years from now as Bromfield. So Hemingway understands that, that, that Bromfield's literary project is, is not modern. Um, Bromfield himself doesn't know this. At the time, he's working very hard to be a successful novelist. But eventually, Bromfield will be revealed as a modernist of another kind, as a, as, as a modernist when it came to agriculture and, and, and gardening, um, as you'll see. So, um, Bromfield tires of the literary scene in Paris, and he decides to settle in this medieval city 30 miles north called Saint-Lys, where he rents a, a, a rectory um, and uh, like a disused rectory and, and renovates it and then begins to lay out this exquisite garden, which becomes a kind of gathering place for all kinds of people. And, and you can see a little bit of the garden. It's, it's set along a river called the Nanette. Look at the photo on the bottom left. Um, and then you see Bromfield in his house taking photographs of some of the um, amazing dahlias that he grew. And there he is at the bottom with his family and their pony named Peter. Um, but just to give you a sense of some of the people that gathered in this garden, in the top left here, we have Gertrude Stein and Alice Toklas in the jungle room, which Bromfield painted with his wife Mary. Um, to the right is a photo of Bromfield with the fashion designer Elsa Scaparelli. 
In the bottom is Janet Flanner, um, enjoying one of the, the, the Sunday afternoon picnics. And then to the right of her is uh, the, the star of stage and screen, Ina Clare. So all these interesting people were kind of jumbled together in Bromfield's garden. And he was very Catholic in his taste for people. He liked all kinds. Uh, but he had a few significant friendships in this period. One of them was with Gertrude Stein. She really admired some of his writing. Um, she also um, uh, relied on Bromfield for gardening tips. She and her partner, Alice Toklas, had a country house in France and they grew uh, vegetables and herbs. And, um, and there are these adorable letters where Stein is kind of badgering Bromfield to give her tips um, since she knows from having visited his garden in Saint-Lys what an expert he is. Uh, perhaps an even re more remarkable friendship is the one he developed with Edith Wharton, who lived in um, an estate not far from Saint-Lys in a town called saint brice sous forêt um, And uh, Wharton, I'm not sure if you folks know this, but was a, was a, a very accomplished gardener. Um, and she had these, this, this very ornate, very orderly gardens, which Bromfield was dazzled by. Um, but this, this kind of rigorous uh, design masked a real passion for the earth. Uh, Bromfield thought, um, and, 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 and it revealed a side of her that most people uh, didn't see, because I think our, our image of Edith Wharton is, is that this kind of like conservative decorous figure. Uh, but Bromfield thought that she was, you know, totally unlike the snobbish society that she satirized in her books, um, but actually um, somebody who was um, really attached to nature. Um, he said uh, uh, of her, we seldom discussed our writing, but we talked frequently and at great length of our dahlias and petunias, our green peas and lettuces. And their, their relationship became a bit competitive. There's a, a cute letter that Wharton sends to Bromfield at one point where she says, if you could see my peonies and California irises here now, you'd drown yourself in the Nonette. And the Nanette, again, is that river that runs alongside Bromfield's house. Here's another photo of Wharton's garden. So you're seeing the kind of severe splendor of her place. Now, um, I'm going to skip this one. OK, Bromfield, um, as much as he admired Wharton's parterres and her formal flower beds, um, he was ultimately more appealed by the kind of rustic style of French peasant gardeners. And he was taught how to garden by this fellow in the left, the bottom left, uh, whose name is Victor Piquet. Um, and Bromfield said that he knew everything about gardening, but he had to watch him in the garden because um, if he didn't, then he would lay the entire garden down in leeks, the backbone of all great French soups. Um, but, uh, you know, Piquet and Bromfield's other neighbors in Saint-Lys kind of gave him a sense of the, the reverence, the care, and also the frugality that the, uh, that the French brought to their land. That it was so unlike the experience that he had growing up in the American Midwest, in Ohio. Uh, you know, Bromfield was dazzled because he knew that the land he was living on had been inhabited for mm, 10 centuries or something. Um, and yet the land, the, uh, the soil, was more fertile than ever before. And he was wondering how this could be the case when in America, farmers could exhaust rich virgin soil in the space of one or two generations. And we have to, we have to remember the historical context, what's happening at the time. Now we're in the uh, early to mid 1930s. And while Bromfield and Wharton are taking tea in their gardens, um, you know, the world is on fire. Um, this is, it, there are massive ecological and economic disasters happening. Uh, you know, there's the Great Depression and there's, um, there are, there's, there, 
there's the Dust Bowl. Um, here's a picture on the left of dust storms in Texas, and then on the right of, a, of a, an eroded uh, cotton field because of bad agricultural practices in Alabama. And Bromfield's kind of like reading accounts of this, and he's thinking about his own family history, um, how his grandfather um, tried to be uh, a great farmer, but was then eventually uh, kind of uh, pushed off the land. Um, and he, uh, and so he writes a novel, which is unlike anything he's ever written before. It's called The Farm. This is 1933. And it's a kind of autobiography. Um, it's, it's a strange book. Uh, there's not that much action. There's very little dialogue. Um, Gertrude Stein thought it was the best thing he ever wrote. Um, we don't know what his friend Edith Wharton thought of it, but it, it really came out of this sense of crisis that Bromfield was experiencing and also the distance that he had so he could kind of see what was happening in America with, an, with, an, with some perspective. Um, the book goes on to become a bestseller and Bromfield, it, you know, it signals this kind of turn toward um, uh, toward thinking about agriculture. And um, he actually starts talking about perhaps leaving France and moving back to America and buying a farm. And, and, and this prospect horrifies Wharton, who writes to him in 1933, I wish that writing a book called The Farm wouldn't immediately make you decide to buy one. If action always follows so rapidly on thought, you will have an agitated existence, and so will Mary. Mary is his long-suffering wife. Um, so, so much else happens in the 1930s, but uh, one, uh, and I, I can't get into it in this presentation, but, but one thing that is important to note, um, is Bromfield's travels to India. In 1933, he took off on a life-changing visit to India. Um, he met a man named Albert Howard, who is known as, he, here he is pictured in the bottom left. He's known as the uh, founding father of the organic movement, and he visited his soil institute in the state of Indore. Um, he also gathered material by staying in the palaces of Maharajas and Maharani's um, uh, for a, a novel that I think is one of his best books, the 1937 novel, The Rains Came, which was turned into a blockbuster film. And here in the bottom, you see a, a very long line of people in New York City lined up to see the, 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 the movie made from his novel. And he fell in love with a mongoose named Ricky Taki. Tavi, after the Kipling story, <laughs> Ricky Taki Tavi. Um, there he is playing with the mongoose in the top. So, um, so these elements um, being exposed to organic agriculture um, and getting all of the, the revenue from this novel are gonna be uh, very important um, for the next chapter. So uh, in 1938, Bromfield decides to move back to America. Um, you know, he's disgusted by the rise of fascism. This is after the, the, the Munich conference. Um, and he has this vague plan to return to his native Ohio and raise his kids on an honest to God farm. Um, you know, the, the war was on, the depression was, or, or, or the, rather the war was coming the depression was still being felt. Um, and Bromfield wanted to build a, a thrifty island of self-sufficiency, um, something like the, as he put it, the medieval fortress manor of France, where a whole community once found security and self-sufficiency, a place which, if necessary, could withstand a siege. It sounds like an appealing prospect right now, even though it's probably a kind of, uh, you know, romantic fantasy, but Bromfield was given to those. Um, so he decided to build his dream farm in a beautiful valley near his native city of Mansfield, Ohio. Um, and he designs 
uh, an elaborate 19 room Greek revival farmhouse loosely inspired by one of his heroes, Thomas Jefferson. And he gives the place an Indian name, Malabar, since it was paid for with profits from his Indian novel, The Rainscape. Um, but when he buys the farm, um, remember, it was the winter. And in the spring of 1939, the, the snow in the valley melts. And Bromfield discovers that this dream farm um, the land is actually worthless. <laughs> uh, you know, um, the, 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 the topsoil had just washed off the hills. It was this sandy, loose, alluvial topsoil. And um, the fields had these huge gullies, so big that you could lose a horse inside them. So, so it was a disaster. And Bromfield, for all of his mm, passion, about agriculture and, um, and excitement about building a farm and the knowledge that he had uh, from gardening in France, he knew that the project of reclaiming 600 eroded acres was totally beyond him. So he decides to connect with a, um, a smart kid from Ohio State named Max Drake. And Drake, is hooked up with some New Deal era soil um, agencies like the, uh, the Soil Conservation Service and uh, the Civilian Conservation Corps. And these people are doing stuff on, uh, on, the, uh, on the cutting edge of, of agriculture and soil science. And, um, and, and, and so he hires Drake and, um, and then Drake sets about modernizing the farm. Uh, he thinks he's been given the reins. Um, Bromfield goes off to Hollywood, which he tends to do because as much as he likes farming, he also likes dancing with starlets. Um, anyways, he comes back from Hollywood and, and, and Drake had called in this, the Civilian Conservation Corps and gotten all this uh, free labor and refit the land and bulldoze the gullies and, and started all these uh, crop rotations. And Bromfield was like, what the heck is going on? I didn't really approve any of this. Um, and he kind of explodes in this expletive lace tirade and Drake thinks he's fired. Um, but Bromfield cools off and and he, um, he says, what's, been, what's, what's, what's happening here? You know, teach me, explain. And this begins the process by which Bromfield transforms himself from a literary playboy into an evangelist for what he calls um, the new agriculture. Um, over the next years, Malabar, Malabar um, completely changes. Uh, it goes from this eroded hill farm into a kind of agrarian paradise. And Bromfield turns it into a showcase um, for a lot of the soil saving techniques that were being developed at this time. And these are things that are now foundational to sustainable and organic agriculture. Things like cover crops and uh, plowing on the, con the natural contour of the land, uh, large scale composting, no-till agriculture, grass farming. Um, so, you know, um, Bromfield was really ahead of his time in advocating for this, uh, but he saw through the experience of Malabar just how powerful these techniques were. He also, with other leading conservationists of the period like Hugh Bennett and Aldo Leopold and Paul Sears, kick-started a, a national organization called the Friends of the Land, which um, kind of uh, was one of the first groups to mainstream environmentalism. Uh, you know, they supported the publication of books and the production of documentary films. And they had this journal called The Land, which is, um, you know, still uh, looked on as a kind of an important achievement by, um, uh, today's agrarians like Wes Jackson. 
Um, and they also did these barnstorming speaking tours throughout the country. And Bromfield was the star speaker and Malabar was the main attraction. Um, here you have a photograph of Bromfield kind of preaching the gospel of soil conservation from the highest point at Malabar, Mount G's. And you can see the kind of rapt attention that he gets. He was a, a fantastic uh, public speaker. Um, he also was extremely early in warning Americans about the danger posed by synthetic pesticides like DDT. Here he is testifying in front of Congress. Um, he actually came out against DDT in a newspaper op-ed published in 1945. That's 17 years before Rachel Carson's Silent Spring. And Bromfield knew that not only was this substance potentially dangerous in itself in terms of, you know, causing terrible diseases and, and, and toxicity, but also it produced an over-reliance um, on the part of, uh, of, of, of farmers. Um, and it disrupted the kind of natural balance of the environment. And it, it, it created a kind of arms race with nature where you had to, um, you know, essentially create ever more powerful um, uh, pesticides and herbicides um, to, uh, to, to kind of, um, uh, uh, you know, outrun the natural resistance that these pests can, can, can uh, have. Uh, Bromfield said that uh, the fundamental should be not the frequently futile doctoring of disease after its inception and development, but the prevention of disease in the first place. And so he was an interested in agriculture that did this. He also envisioned a future in which food companies would print a special label on their products to verify that their foods had not been touched by chemicals. And of course, um, we have that label today. Um, you know, he wasn't only uh, concerned with agriculture. This is somebody who was engaged in a lot of respects, um, including politically. And um, he was uh, one of the very few prominent Americans who tried to raise awareness of the Holocaust as it was unfolding. Um, this is a telegram that he sent to his friend, Eleanor Roosevelt in 1943. Um, basically saying, uh, you know, hundreds of, of thousands, if not millions of Jews are being killed um, in, in the Nazi death camps. And it's surprising how little the international community seems to care about this. And uh, Roosevelt replied very coldly, I do not see what can, I, I, I do not see what can be done until we win the war. Um, but ultimately, Bromfield's ad advocacy and the advocacy of, of, of people in a group um, that he was uh, involved in actually helped create the, um, the War Refugee Board, which is credited with saving the lives of hundreds of thousands of European civilians, mostly Jews. Um, he wasn't always so prophetic, however. He... Um, uh, during World War II set off a, a, a national panic over farm policy uh, to avert what he feared was a, a famine coming to the home front. Um, critics at the time called him the prophet of starvation. Um, but um, he, he was very savvy when it came to publicity. Um, and uh, perhaps the greatest example of that was the marriage of Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall in 1945. Now, I mentioned that Bromfield had business in Hollywood. He was a screenwriter and he liked hanging out there. Um, but he shrewdly used his Hollywood connections to kind of raise the profile of Malabar. And that, in turn, helped shine a light on his environmental crusade. So he was a, a, a master of PR before that term really existed. Um, anyways, I'm gonna, I'm gonna close here um, with, uh, um, with this concept that Bromfield had of being touched. Um, this is one of the, the, the key concepts of the book and I think it was very fundamental to Bromfield's thinking. The word touched is a kind of rural variant of, 
of touch that's in a little crazy. And it comes from an eccentric cousin of Bromfield uh, named Phoebe Wise, who lived in a, in a cottage outside of Mansfield. Um, and she lived, uh, she had a kind of crazy jungly garden. She lived with wild animals. And, and Bromfield as a young boy was, was totally transfixed by her. And he liked to play in her garden, you know, with, with, the, um, with the horses. She, she had like a wild uh, horse that kept guard, um, like a, her guard dog was a horse. Anyways, um, uh, at one point Phoebe um, saw Bromfield playing and said to Bromfield's father, cousin Charlie, that boy is touched. Um, and what she meant by that is that he seemed to have a, a kind of deep, almost mystical connection with nature. Um, and so this is the, a trait that Bromfield felt in himself and sought out in people all his life. He found it in people like Edith Wharton. He found it in people like Doris Dukes, the billionaire tobacco heiress with whom Bromfield had a love affair late, late in life. Um, and, um, and, and, and it meant, it meant blending into the pattern of life. It meant um, uh, loving um, animals. And Bromfield was of course a serious animal lover. I love this photograph of him on the left with the raccoon. Um, uh, and of course he had a, uh, a multi-generational clan of boxer dogs. Here you see, have him sleeping with them on the right. Um, you know, this is somebody who loved life in all of its manifestations, uh, whether it was a, a Maharani or a movie star or a French peasant he, um, or a moral mushroom or a tulip poplar or, um, you know, uh, a, a dairy cow munching on Ladino clover. Um, and, uh, and he infected everyone with the enthusiasm he had for the natural world. Um, and, you know, he wrote beautifully about Malabar, uh, but I think that the greatest single description of the farm was that E.B. White poem in The New Yorker. I just want to read you one stanza, because I think it's very charming. So E.B. White writes, a farm is always in some kind of tizzy, but Bromfield's place is really busy. Strangers arriving by every train, Bromfield terracing against the rain, Catamounts crying, mowers mowing, guest rooms full to overflowing, boxers in every room of the house, cows being milked to Brahms and Strauss, kids arriving by van and pung, Bromfield up to his eyes in dung, sailors, trumpeters, mystics, actors, all of them wanting to drive the tractors, all of them eager to husk the corn, some of them sipping their drinks till morn. Anyways, Thank you so much for your time, and I'd be happy to answer any questions if you have them. Thank you, Stephen. That was uh, really, really a fascinating overview of your book. And Stephen, um, excuse me, um, Bromfield sounds like a really, really interesting guy. I have not yet had the chance to read the book, but I do intend to. And especially after hearing everything you had to say tonight, I want to remind everybody that um, you can submit your questions if you're on Zoom. Just type them in the Q&A. If you're on Facebook, put them in the chat. We'll bring them over. Um, and we do have some people that have asked questions already. So I'm going to start with Kurt. Um, his first question is, why did Bromfield choose this particular spot for his farm? Um, you know, he writes about this um, in, in, in his first farming memoir, Pleasant Valley, which came out in 1945 and became a national bestseller. Um, he, his father was in local politics growing up and he would take these, um, these kind of horse and buggy rides into the countryside and they would sometimes help out farmers in the fields. And so he had a lot of uh, affection for the countryside around Mansfield. Um, I don't know if, if, if um, you've actually visited Malabar, but it's an absolutely gorgeous spot. And I think that on that snowy day in late 1938, when Bromfield was driving around, he was just struck by the beauty of the valley, by the tall trees. Um, there was a creek running through the farm. It was an old stone farmhouse. 
um, owned by people that he knew. The, um, the, the woman who answered the, do the door uh, by the name of Herring, uh, Mrs. Herring, um, actually uh, recognized Bromfield and remembered him as the boy who used to fish in the creek Allegedly, I mean, Bromfield is a bit of a, a fabulous, so you know, you can't take everything that he says literally. Um, but nevertheless, um, I think he was struck by the beauty of this place. And like I said, he didn't know how what, what bad condition the land was in until after he bought it and the snow melted, and then he realized. And I think it's a great thing in, in, in actuality that he bought such poor land because it sent him on this trajectory towards soil conservation. Okay, and uh, Kurt also has another question. Um, how did visitors get to the farm from Columbus by train and car, presumably? You mean at the time? Um, yeah, I assume by, by car or train. I mean, people came from all over, all over the world, really, to visit Malabar. Um, I mean, especially people who are interested in um, agriculture. Uh, but it was a uh, a pilgrimage site, I guess, for early environmentalists. And you said he had lots of celebrities that also showed up? Lot, <laughs> lots of celebrity visitors, absolutely, <laughs> yeah. Interesting. Um, so here's another question. Um, did Bronfield have a relationship with Henry Wallace, Secretary of Agriculture and Vice President? Absolutely he did, and it's, um, it, I go into great detail about that relationship in the book. Um, you know, Wallace is a very sympathetic figure who I have a lot of affection for, and Bromfield did too, up to a certain point in time when he kind of broke with him. But Wallace was very much a supporter of the Friends of the Land in the, um, in, uh, the early 1940s, and um, there was even a conference in, I think, Louisville, where Bromfield and, and uh, Wallace were both uh, the keynote speakers. Um, but, uh, but there's a, a, a falling out, um, and it, it, it's a little complicated. It has to do with a New Deal bureaucracy and, um, and, uh, and, and, and some of the things that Bromfield's worried about in the last years of the war, and he thinks the FDR administration is not taking seriously enough. But obviously these two men who had both risen to such prominence, but who had agricultural backgrounds were naturally, um, uh, you know, they, there was a natural kinship there. Interesting. So um, there's someone else asking the question, was uh, Bromfield interested in forestry practices from the same holistic approach? It's very interesting. I mean, he definitely thought that the woods were important to a farm um, for a whole host of reasons. Um, and he worked hard to preserve the woods at Malabar. You know, I didn't get into the kind of end game of Malabar, but Bromfield ran into a series of financial difficulties, and um, he he criticized farmers when he was doing well for cutting down their timber um, to raise cash. Uh, uh, but he himself ultimately had to do that in a very uh, select way because he was in such dire financial straits. So even though it went against his ecological principles, he actually set a contract to, to cut down some timber in Malabar and was rescued at the last minute by his friend and lover, Doris Duke. And that is why a section of woods at Malabar is now named the Doris Duke Woods. That's interesting. Very mm -hmm. cool. Um, so another question here is, how have his ancestors continued his dedication to nature and farming, or have they? Very interesting question. Um, so uh, when I began this project, Bromfield had three daughters. Um, the eldest had already died when I began this project, and, um, and the, middle, the middle daughter actually died, I, basically as soon as I set, set out to write the book. And then the youngest daughter, Ellen, had this extraordinary life. Um, she, 
she wanted to follow in her father's footsteps. She was a writer and a farmer. Um, but Bromfield's personality was was very difficult for for reasons that you know you can read about in my book. But basically, he drove her off the farm, and she went with her husband Carson to Brazil, where uh, a bunch of conservation-minded businessmen had actually opened an outpost of Malabar, and she she and her husband ran that farm, and. They uh, um, eventually found their own farm and spent their whole lives in agriculture. And Ellen wrote books just like her dad. And her own kids, I think that she has five uh, children, um, most of them are involved in agriculture one way or another. And um, uh, so, so, so the heritage has been passed on. How uh, it, it was very sad. I had, I had the, the opportunity to meet Ellen when I was writing this book and uh, to interview her, but she sadly died before it came out. Um, so I, was, I, was, I really regret that she had no chance to read it. So Malabar Farm is um, give or take an hour and 15, hour and 20 minutes from Hudson. Um, yes. So uh, some people like me might only know it exists because they've seen its name on a road sign. Yeah, uh, but uh, once I learned about your book, I did look it up and I saw that it is now an Ohio State Park mm. and, um, and you, we can visit. And the question in the chat is, does the farm still adhere to Bromfield's farming principles? Um, I mean, the short answer is no. Um, you know, they, 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 they still grow crops and they're planted along Bromfield's original contours. But uh, you know they 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 grow corn um, and wheat I think um, uh, kind of commodity crops um, so they're not really diversified they're not necessarily I mean they they raise cattle too I don't want to like uh, I actually think that they're extraordinary um, custodians of Bromfield's legacy but mm -hmm. Malabar has not necessarily been made into um, the educational center for sustainable agriculture that I think it could be, um, you know, the dairies and cobwebs, the vegetable stand that Bromfield built with his own hands uh, is empty. Um, the, you know, I think the restaurant, um, uh, which had been there for many years is, is not there. They're looking for a new tenant. And it's a, it's a gorgeous place in a beautiful part of Ohio um, and I think that the current park manager has a lot of exciting plans for it. Um, and I really would encourage everyone who's listening to, to visit. I know that they're open during the pandemic. I don't know if the big house, which is what Bromfield called his 19 room manor house, is open for tours now because of the pandemic. But normally, it is, and it's perfectly preserved. You can go and you can visit and see Bromfield's office and the bed where Boki and Bacall spent their wedding night, and you can see the, the scratch marks on the doors from all the boxers he had. So uh, it's an extraordinary place to visit. Yeah, it really looked lovely just from looking at the pictures. Um, now let's move, uh, we have a couple questions about his literary career. Um, sure. Actually two here that kind of we can put together, I think. Um, any thoughts on why Bromfield has been overshadowed by Fitzgerald and Hemingway in writing history where they are readily, where they are readily known, yet Lewis is not? And along with that, why is his writing not better known today? Did he stop writing to focus on agriculture? Um, well, I'll take them in reverse order. So he never, in, in, well, at the very end, he stopped writing novels. Um, but the truth is, after he came back to America, after the Great Depression, after World War II, after the soil crisis and the Dust Bowl, art for art's sake, literature became impossible for Bromfield. He really felt like he was on a mission, and, uh, and, and that mission was Malabar. And his literary output be kind of bifurcated. He wrote agricultural books, which were filled with passion, and there's some beautiful nature writing. And then he wrote kind of like potboiler novels, 
um, just to fund the enterprise. Um, but up until that point, 19, mid 1930s, Bromfield tried very hard to be an artist, to be a novelist. And, um, and some of his books are great. I mean, the question of why, I mean, I don't think they're, they're that great, honestly. I mean, I think that they're, they, they're charming. You know, you take a book like Early Autumn and it's very interesting to me the way it prefigures some of the ideas that are, that are important to Bromfield's biography and it's an affecting story but it is, uh, it doesn't feel as kind of modern as, as, as some great works by Fitzgerald and Hemingway. I mean, you know, if you open The Sun Also Rises, for instance, um, leaving aside all of the kind of uh, sexual and racial politics of that book, it reads kind of like it was written yesterday. And Bromfield's works don't have that quality of timelessness. They feel dated for what, you know, despite their charm. Okay, so uh, Laura says she visited Malbar Farm last year and she says it's a gorgeous place. And she wants to know if you could tell us a little bit more about the involvement of the Ohio State University Agricultural Extension and Bromfield. Oh, that's a really interesting question about which I don't know much. Um, you know, I think that Max Drake had been an extension agent, um, and uh, but I don't, I don't know to what extent there was a formal relationship um, that informed much of what Bromfield was doing. As I mentioned, he was connected to lots of different people all around the world and Malabar kind of became a clearinghouse for new ideas about agriculture. Um, so I'm not sure about that, that specific relationship. It's not something I get into much in the book. Okay, um, so this just came up. Um, our town's historian, Tom, Thomas Vince, has confirmed that Bromfield sponsored two students who were sons of a friend of his to attend the Western Reserve Academy in Hudson. Do you have any further information about this? I have a bit. It's an interesting story that ultimately I left out of the book. Um, Bromfield had a very close friend in France um, who, uh, a, a woman who was married to uh, a French Jew of foreign extraction who became a member of the resistance, and I think he was in prison for a time. In any case, I believe, and I'm happy to share what research I have on this, um, uh, Bromfield helped take care of the kids and maybe paid for some or all of their education. The name of the family escapes me right now, but there's a lot of material in the archives at Ohio State University. If somebody wants to pursue this story. Ultimately, and Bromfield's a fascinating figure, and he had his hands in so many different spheres. Ultimately, I had to kind of confine the canvas of, a bit um, and focus on, you know, agriculture and the environment and, and Bromfield's, I think, interesting path there. So I couldn't get into a story like that, which I thought, as interesting as it was, wasn't necessarily germane to the main themes of the book. Sure, that makes perfect sense. Um, now, another question, um, more specific for, for you. Someone wants to know if you are a gardener, and along with that, I'd like to, I'm curious to know, you know, if your interest, I mean, you did explain how you found out about Bromfield and, and um, how you came to write the book, but was there an, your interest in gardening involved in that at all, if you have one? You know, like a lot of people, I've started a little victory garden since the pandemic, um, but the truth is, I, you know, I care a great deal about food, but my background is as a consumer, uh, not as a farmer, not as a gardener. Um, you know, I, I'm a child of the American suburbs. Uh, I grew up eating like, uh, you know, fast food and TV dinners. And um, I didn't know any gardeners or farmers, you know, but I became, uh, as, I, as I grew up, I became more interested in food initially because uh, I, of how pleasurable it was. 
but then I became, I, I realized, you know, there are all of these um, problems around food, uh, environmental problems, uh, labor problems, um, health problems. Um, and it's, it's actually this thing that brings us great pleasure and sustenance is actually incredibly fraught. And then I got interested in, in the history of alternative agriculture and all these other things. And obviously for the book, I had to spend a fair amount of time on farms and talking to farmers, but, but, um, but no, I mean, the short answer is no, I, I don't have a lot of experience gardening and farming. Um, although I think that this project has ignited a genuine passion for it. And it's something that I hopefully will continue and, um, and my interests will only uh, grow from here. Oh, that's that sounds good, and, and we certainly hope that happens. Um, if anyone else has a question, we have, still have a couple minutes. I think, um, you know, if anybody wants to type another quick one in. And um, meanwhile, I will say that um, we are delighted to have you here, Stephen, and um, remind everyone that this book, which, by the way, way, received some fantastic reviews, is available for purchase from the Learned Owl, our local bookstore. and. Um, there is a link in the chat if anybody wants to do that. Um, and since I don't see any other questions, I guess we're about done for the evening. Again, thank you so much, Stephen, for being with us. It was an absolute pleasure. Thank you very much for having me. And we'll talk to you again soon. Okay. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone.